Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair and Ranking Member Portman for this hearing. And a special thank you to all of our witnesses for the important work that you do to prepare our communities for natural disasters and for coming before this committee today. And I'll add my own appreciation to that you've heard from uh, the Ranking Member and the Chair uh, for all of the volunteers and first responders and disaster preparedness uh, folks in our states and our communities. You do life-saving, life-stabilizing um, work, and you help um, our communities be resilient in the face of just incredible difficulties. So I just want to thank you all for what you do. And I want to start with a question to Mr. Hancock. Um, I'm chair of the Subcommittee on Emerging Threats and Spending Oversight. So I'm particularly focused on ensuring that the federal government spends taxpayer dollars efficiently and that we reduce waste, fraud, and abuse. In 2018, as Senator Peters mentioned in his opening, a FEMA-sponsored report indicated that every dollar spent on federal mitigation grants six dollars in savings. So Mr. Hancock, how can we improve the ability of states and localities to invest in mitigation before a disaster strikes? Um, I think the, the best way to do that is with the federal government uh, partnering with the states to increase the, uh, the capacity of states to respond. Um, so states are e much more easy uh, it's more easy for them to assist communities so with fema providing assistance to the states um, to in increase their um, particular floodplain management capacity in other words staffing um, so that they can in turn then work with the local communities um, we think that is a, a efficient way to go about that um, and an example, um, SEMA men mentioned, uh, SEMA Merritt from Ohio mentioned that, that Ohio didn't get any of the uh, uh, competitive uh, BRIC funding, neither did Michigan, only the set aside. And that, that's an area where um, within BRIC, um, there could be a program within BRIC that, that just simply funds state assistance to increase the capacity of state governments to assist the, uh, the local communities. Thank you. Uh, to Ms. Merrick, for a long time I've heard from emergency management professionals in my state about the need to reduce the complexity of many FEMA programs and processes. In 2017, FEMA announced an initiative to co-locate teams of FEMA field staffers with state and local partners to improve communication and coordination between federal, state, and local partners. These teams, known as FEMA integration teams, or FIT, were created to help state and local partners more easily navigate some of FEMA's bureaucracy. Emergency management officials in New Hampshire have responded positively to the creation of a FIT in my state, in New Hampshire. So based on your perspective as president of the National Emergency Manager Management Association, have you found that FITs have been helpful in bridging the gap between state, local, and federal partners? I know today we don't have a FIT team. Make sure am I unmuted? Yes. There I'm you sorry. are. Yes. Okay. Um, in Ohio, we don't we don't have an, a fit team member or an integrated uh, team, um, but reviews from other state directors that do have been very positive. Recently, I was at FEMA Region Five in Chicago, and um, my partner states the majority of them do have um, one or two in their state that have been helpful in the area in which they're hired you know, in the preparedness and planning sections um, to help navigate mitigation um, and working in some of the other programs. So I don't have a tremendous amount on this, but I do know that as my colleagues and I have talked about it, they have been pleased with the FIT members that they have on their teams from FEMA. Well, thank you for that, and I, I'd look forward to learning more about uh, reactions from other states because it seems to me that uh, this might be an area that we want to expand on. Uh, Ms. Merrick, I have another question for you. Uh, federal disaster recovery funds administered by FEMA allow a small percentage of each grant to be used to cover management costs like grant processing or oversight. 
Currently, management costs awarded for one disaster can only be used for that particular disaster. Ms. Merrick, what are the benefits of changing FEMA's policy so that it permits states and localities to utilize dollars provided for management costs across all open declared disasters? Sure, thank you, and, and, and thank you very much for, for asking that question. Um, you know, states can utilize a certain portion of disaster costs to, cut, to cover some of the administrative costs of the event. Currently, those funds are limited to a specific disaster, as you indicated. This creates a disincentive to close out disasters quickly as states naturally want to utilize um, as much of that funding as possible, and by keeping that open, they can do so. If management costs were disaster agnostic, states would be able to focus more on the recovery process than the, administration, the administrative minutia of tracking hours per disaster. If we are allowed to roll over those management costs, we can not only close out disasters much faster, but also utilize those funds to build capacity in the long term for anything that we may face. I should note here that NEMA was grateful to your staff for working with us last year and getting legislation drafted and hope we can get something introduced again soon. Well, I, I thank you for that, and I would look forward to continuing to work with you on that. Uh, I do have one more question, uh, but I think it would take us over time, so I will submit it for the record. And uh, I'm now going to recognize Senator Rosen, who should be with us uh, virtually. Thank you, Senator Rosen. Um, Senator Johnson, are you, you're not available, okay. So I do have a, a, another question uh, for Mr. Hancock. Climate change is increasing the cost of disaster response and recovery. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, otherwise known as NOAA, tells us that 2020 set numerous records. 22 extreme weather and climate events, which each caused $1 billion or more in losses. Recent disasters, like the flooding that impacted New Hampshire communities this summer, underscore the need for action to safeguard the nation's infrastructure, protect businesses and communities, and save taxpayer dollars. The bipartisan infrastructure package includes funding that I push for to help communities invest in coastal resiliency measures. Mr. Hancock, could you discuss the importance of investments to help prepare for and mitigate damage from more frequent flooding events and other disasters spurred by the changing climate? Yeah, um, so the amount of, of disasters, like you said, are increasing uh, so much so that uh, Communities are, um, as a few other people have said, it's one disaster after another after another. So the, capa the, the capacity issue, I think, um, is kind of comes back in this question that um, states or communities don't have the capacity to respond to one after another after another. And so this is where uh, we could use assistance from the federal government to help us increase our capacity during times when we aren't having uh, disasters. So, and this was talked about a little bit earlier, but a lot of the funding for dis um, disaster response and recovery comes from disaster disasters. Well, it would be more helpful if it were more consistent um, and weren't tied to individual disasters. And if we just increase capacity unrelated to uh, to events. Got it. I also just wanted to follow up on that because generally we have um, considered historic flood patterns when we look at uh, planning and investment and mitigation. How important is it for state and local governments as well as the federal government to consider future flood risk in their infrastructure plans? That is a great question. Um, so just like you said, most, most flood maps and most of the uh, planning we do is based on what happened in the past. Um, and to use one, one example, me, I work at a local community and respond to building proposals. Well, when buildings are built, they're not built for uh, just for today, they're built for decades. And so to plan for a safe building based on what happened in the past may not necessarily make that building safe in the future. 
So um, there, and you can apply that logic to, to any infrastructure, whether it be a dam or uh, stormwater pipes. But um, when we're building infrastructure, we're really building those for the future. And so having future conditions shown on flood maps would give communities uh, the ability to plan, plan uh, appropriately for the infrastructure and buildings of the future. Well, thank you for that answer. I'm just going to check with our crew here. Is Senator Padilla available? Okay, so uh, next up is Senator Padilla. 